Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <coughs> so, I guess this mic is too humble. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll speak today. Little bit down, little like this. Yeah. So I'll speak today on the topic of the sweetly topsy turvy world of Ramayana. <laughs> <laughs> so topsy turvy means that as the words, it's a childish word. It's topsy turvy. There's a childish rhyme in it. T T Y Y topsy turvy. So what does it mean? Upside down. Upside down. Exactly. So what do we mean by upside down? I will talk about two three incidents from the Ramayana which illustrate this upside down principle, and then I'll talk about how bhakti also has a sweet topsy turviness to it. <coughs> the first principle is that. there is a normal order and a hierarchy to things and some people feel there should be no hierarchy everybody should be equal yeah everybody should have equal opportunity but you cannot have equal results if in a class right in the beginning am i audible behind if in the class right in the beginning it is said that all the students are going to get equal marks the students will have no impetus to study if we see in a sports match say in a in a cricket match there is a cricket there are some players who are superstars in football there are superstars in tennis there are superstars whichever game you have now as soon as the superstar enters the field hundreds and thousands of people cheer now there may be many players over there but that one player's entry brings far more cheers that player is considered to be the best among all players and that player say in cricket bowls a spectacular ball or catches a spectacular catch or hits a spectacular shot then there are so many cheers over there because of that you now people sometimes have a uh, replays of that shot being played and now the world cricket world cup fever is coming up in india i don't know if it is there here so in 2011 when india won the world cup the shot which the indian captain hit at that time to win the world cup at that time that is that is the most replayed youtube video about cricket <laughs> so like devotees want to remember krishna so people want to replay and remember that moment again and again so now here what is happening why is one player given so much attention and uh, uh, affection and appreciation because hierarchies indicate a level of excellence somebody is at the top that player has excellence in a particular field and because of that excellence in that particular field they they get appreciation they get they get applause they get adoration so hierarchies exist naturally in the world in in to live in life we all have to accomplish certain tasks the very fact of living require some tasks that we have to build a house now if we say we have absolute equality that means everybody will have equal chance to build a house well okay if you are talking about equal chance in terms of buying a house and owning a house yes that's fine but person who has no training in building a house if we have democracy anybody who wants to build a house build their house <laughs> look here us so there has to be competence it's 30 and wherever there is competence there has to be a hierarchy so in principle hierarchies are not bad in fact hierarchies are essential they first of all give us a direction for working in our own lives okay i am here i want to go there and they also are a testimony to the potential of human beings for excellence so <clears throat> as a in sports in any field now one cynical way of looking at life is anybody who is successful in their lives so i would say you know this in the first place is become very wealthy very famous very powerful whatever way, very very a cynical way of looking at it is this person must have manipulated things 
That's why this person became so. <coughs> now, in some cases, it does happen that hierarchies become unfair. Hierarchies become unexploited. And then some people get to the top, not because of their competence. They get to the top simply sometimes just because of the family in which they were born or because of the community in which they are born. So, in such cases, where the hierarchy is not based on competence, it leads to a lot of problems. And people resent and people want to uh, overthrow the hierarchy. But still, it's one thing to want to overthrow the hierarchy. But then, if you want to take up responsibility and do something, to get to the top of the hierarchy might be easy, it's difficult. But after getting to the top of the hierarchy, to manage everything is not that easy. There is a story uh, associated with the Puranas that once a person prayed to Brahmaji. And when Brahmaji came in front of him, he said that, Brahmaji, what do you want? What boon do you want? So he said, I want, I want your brain. I want your intelligence power. <laughs> so Brahmaji said, you can't take this. He says, you don't have the capacity. He says, no, no, I want it. He says, no, you will not be able to take it. He says, no, I want it. And Brahmaji said, regretfully, the <laughs> And then he got the brain, and within moments, you know, his brain just exploded. Wow. Brahmaji has such responsibilities, he, his brain is of a different level. And a human body cannot hold Brahmaji's brain. So, we may all want to get to the top of a hierarchy, wherever we are in. But it's not easy to maintain the level of competence that is required to execute things properly when we are at the top of the hierarchy. So now, the bhakti introduces us to a fundamental hierarchy. That hierarchy is that we, first we are not God. Sometimes we may feel it is unfortunate that I am not God. But after some time we realize it is fortunate we are not God. <laughs> so we are not God, but we are the servants of God. So there is a hierarchy of being in which God exists at the top. And then we exist at various levels. There are different, different living beings who exist at different levels of the hierarchy. So in a sense, Bhakti first establishes this hierarchy. Mamaivam sho jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatanaha so Krishna says in 15.7 that we are all parts and Krishna is the whole. And he says that those who reject this hierarchy, those who do not accept that Krishna is the whole, they try to get wholeness, they try to get completeness, they try to get satisfaction by doing what their mind and senses are telling them. And what happens by that? Manahishashthani driyani prakriti sthani karishati They are dragged by their mind and senses, here, there and everywhere. Vishla Prabhupada says in lecture, if you don't accept God as Almighty, then your senses will become Almighty. <laughs> your senses and your mind will become Almighty. Now, eat this, watch this, touch this, do this, that, do that. We'll just run here and there. We'll not be able to achieve anything constructive in life. So basically, hierarchy is desirable. At the same time, <clears throat> Bhakti Initially, it begins by upholding the hierarchy. Yes, God is supreme and we are his tiny insignificant servants. But then Bhakti doesn't just uphold the hierarchy. Bhakti also appends the hierarchy. Append means like topsy-turvy. Turn it upside down. In Bhakti, it is not that God delights in his supreme majesty. And everybody has to forever bow down to him. It's not like that. The Krishna or Ram, or whichever manifestation of God is there, he delights in the sweet reciprocation of love. And for that purpose, he takes various roles. And one such role he takes is that of subordinate to his devotees. So in the Ramayana, in the Aranyakanda, that time, Ram is in the forest. And Ram always approaches everything very positively. 
when when he has been exiled to the forest or some citizens come to him and say that this is such a great injustice this is a horrible atrocity you have been banished for no reason and at that time ram says actually i have an opportunity to go to the forest and associate with the great sages and enrich myself with this wisdom from them normally i would have had to wait till i get to vanaprastha and then i could retire and then i could go to the sages but now i have that opportunity right now so he said this is an opportunity this is not adversity so sometimes we may have to do something because of negativity and now ram would not have himself voluntarily wanted to go to the forest but but the negativity there was a conspiracy against him because of which he had to go to the forest we may have to do something because of negativity but we don't have to do that thing in negativity the the cause which makes us do something might be negative but our consciousness while doing it need not be negative so yes it was unfortunate that he was con- that he was exiled because of conspiracy but ram took it very positively and that's what he did when he went to the forest he would go to the various sages meet them and he would um, hear from them so in the naam ramayana it is described some of the prominent sages that ram met does anyone know who the first sage that ram met when he went to the forest yeah agastya was the fourth sage kaushik kaushik was vishwamitra kaushik maka samrakshaka ram that is one of the names in the naam ramayana so kaushik was vishwamitra that's of course he went but the first sage to meet but that was in his when he had gone earlier not when exiled so first he came out of ramayana and he went to <coughs> bharatwaj mukhanand grama he met bharatwaj and he asked bharatwaj where should i stay bharatwaj is very venerate and he says he said you can stay with me in my ashram everybody wanted the association of ram and ram said yes i'll be honored to have your association but is very close to ayodhya and people will if they know i am staying here they will come repeatedly and they will beseech me to come back to them and they will disturb the peace of your ashram and also the ayodhya vasis will not gain that sense of acceptance that i have left see as long as there is some hope that something can change then we don't move forward i was in calgary last year and i was asked to speak in the university on the topic of uh, death and uh, death rituals in hinduism it's an interesting topic apparently they were studying death and so then the one student asked this question isn't it brutal that you just burn the body so the person whom you have loved how can you just burn them should we respectfully bury them <laughs> so just <laughs> <coughs> and i explained that <clears throat> actions have to be seen in the context of the world view so in the abraham i think some of you may have to come ahead i think i also have to move back so um, in the abrahamic religions somehow people think that the body and the soul are inseparable the abrahamic religion accept the idea of a soul but the soul and soul and body will stay together and that's why christianity has the idea of resurrection just as jesus came back in the same body so we will also when we are delivered on judgment day will come back in the same body that's why they preserve the body <coughs> but in the dharmic traditions it is understood that the soul and the body are different and the soul needs to go from this body to the next body after death the soul is an onward journey of spiritual evolution and in this body the soul has lived for some time and now this body is over so it's like suppose sometimes we were staying in a house as a tenant 
and suddenly we get uh, the tenancy claim, tenancy term expiry notice or eviction notice and we have to leave the house. Now it's okay somebody left the house but somebody just starts fondly looking at the house and all the memories and you stay over there. You can't stay on the streets. Now you have to go to the next house. So similarly for the soul, the body is like a house. And the soul is very strongly attached to the body. So what the, what the cremation where the body is burned does is that it gives the soul a sense of irrevocable closure. The soul might hover around hoping to re-enter into the body, hoping to again live the life that the soul was living. But when the body is burned to ashes, then it becomes clear that I cannot, I cannot enter away. Then the soul becomes ready to move on to the next destination. So similarly, Ram wants to give a sense of closure. He says, if I stay over here, it will not be good. The Yudhavas will keep coming. And Bharadwaj appreciates Ram's thoughtfulness. And he says, it's a, some distance away from here, there's a secluded beautiful mountain. Which is the mountain? Chitrakut. So Chitrakut. So he says you can go and stay over there. And then that is where Ram goes. Chitrakut Adriniketan Rama. So you can repeat this name. We'll recite the names of Ram from Nam Rama as we come to that particular past time. So Chitrakut Adriniketan Rama. Chitrakut Adriniketan Rama. So Chitrakut is the mountain. Adri is the Chitrakut is the name of the mountain. Adri is the mountain. Niketan is where the home is there. Rama. So Lord Ram made his home on Chitrakuta. And there he stayed for some time. That is where uh, 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 Bharat came to meet him. And then Bharat was sent back with the uh, Padukas. And after staying there for some time, Ram decided that let me go deeper into the forest. He felt that he has, now that he has come to the forest, he had heard that there are many demons who are disrupting the order of the uh, uh, disrupting the sages over there. So he decided to go southward. And the Chitrakut is, if you consider the India's map, it is way up in the north. So Ram came all the way down to Dandakavan Janapavan Rama. Dandakavan Janapavan Rama. So he came to Dandakavan, the Dandaka forest. Vana Janapavan. Pavan means he purified all the people over there. So he came to Dandakaran. And while he was going along on this journey, he met some sages. So there are two uh, basically, uh, the first sage was Bharadwaj, the second sage was Sharabhanga, the third sage was Sudhikshna. Hmm? And the Sudhikshna's guru was what you mentioned, Agastya. Hmm? So now Agastya is a very, very great sage. He's like, like Narada is present almost everywhere in the Vedic literature. So even Agastya is also a very great sage. So when he went to, now when he Ram goes, he goes in the mood of worship. These are sages, he offers their respect to them. But the sages know that he is God. So it described Nam Ramana. Sarabhanga Sudhikshna Archit Rama. Sarabhanga Sudhikshna Archit Rama. Archit. That is they offered their worship to him. And then, now Sarabhanga, and Sudhikshna. Both of them are friends. But Sudhikshna is the disciple of Agastya. And in Sudhikshna, he is he's amazed, astounded, delighted. That Lord, he had been always meditating in the heart. Suddenly, he sees a Lord right in front of him. Hey, am I having a dream? Am I having an illusion? He looks up and actually closes his eyes and looks open his eyes. He says, yeah, actually, the same Lord is there. You know, now, and similarly, Yashoda Mai also had this question. When she asked Krishna to open his mouth, and Krishna opens his mouth, ah, and she sees the whole universe over there. Universe with the stars and the sky and the mountains, and she, on top of that, she sees Vrindavan, and in Vrindavan, she sees the, all the, the village and the Rajivas, and she sees herself. And she sees herself looking at the mouth of Krishna. <laughs> so what is this? As she, she says, start thinking, is it? Start thinking, what could be happening? She says, am I asleep and am I dreaming? <laughs> then she says, no, I'm awake. I'm not sleeping. 
Then he says, am I in delusion? <coughs> but I can see everything around me. Then, is it that Maya is acting and putting me in illusion? She thinks that actually I am this is this is a simple, innocent, coward woman. Why would Maya put me in illusion like this? Uh, is Krishna doing some magic? Is Krishna, he doesn't even have enough self-control to stop eating mud. <laughs> so how can he do any magic? So she just closes her eyes and she's, when Krishna sees he's getting bewildered and Krishna says, this is Rasabhas. <laughs> he wants his mother to be in a motherly mood, not in the mood of a devotee worshipping the Lord. So immediately, and if she closes her eyes to blink and look again, and she says, oh, it's my little boy is back here, he's opening mouth and he's just looking at me. I said, enough, like sometimes you ask a child to open the mouth, how long? <laughs> so Krishna says, enough now. Well, Krishna brother Yasha just takes him and hugs him and then starts offering her milk to him. But similarly, when Suddhikshna sees Ram, he's astounded. That Lord he'd been meditating on for so long. This is hard. Suddenly now he's in front. He's beside himself with joy. He offers his respects. Now, after this, uh, Ram actually plays the role of a human being. In the Ramayana, the driving question of the Ramayana is that what are the characteristics of an ideal human being? That's why Ram does not always act as if he is God. Sometimes he does, but here he normally acts as just a human being. And he says, oh, oh, oh sage, don't, please accept my respects. And then Sudhishna says, let me take you to my guru. It's such a great privilege. The Lord is here. Let me take him. And then he, they together go to Agastya. Agastyanugraha Vardhit Rama Agastyanugraha Vardhit Rama Anugraha means blessing or grace. Vardhit. Vardhit means became greater, more powerful. He grew. So when he goes to Agastya, eventually Agastya gives him instructions and gives him special celestial weapons. And Actually, Agastya will appear later toward the end of the Ramayana also, where he will give, reveal the Aditya Rudaya prayers, which will empower Ram in the final battle with Ravana. But at this place, when, August, when Ram comes to the presence of Agastya, so Dikshna is so delighted because he's, he's seeing the Lord with him and he's not talking about his Guru, he tells about all, a, as they're walking, it's a significant distance, he tells about the glories of Agastya. It's overwhelmed with joy. Now glorifying his guru in front of his Lord. Uh, it's, it's ecstasy for him. And as he moves forward and they come to Agastya, Agastya has his wife Anasuya. So Sita goes inside and Sita is instructed. She, she consults him and gets guidance from her. And Ram and Lakshman sit and hear from Agastya. Now at this point, there is something very special happening. So normally, the guru takes the shishya to God. Mm. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but has, what has happened over here? Shisha. The shishya the 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 is taking God to the guru. <laughs> so, the hierarchy is inverted over here. The hierarchy is inverted. And... <clears throat> When Srila Prabhupada was asked, even we practice bhakti and go back to the spiritual world. So what will happen over there? So Prabhupada said, I'll be there to welcome you. And I will, per <laughs> and I will personally introduce you to Krishna. So that's the, the Guru takes us to Krishna. But here, the sweet privilege that Sudhikshna had by the grace of Ram was that the disciple took God to the Guru. So this is the topsy-turvy world of the Ramayana. That where there is a normal hierarchy, but there is there is an inverted hierarchy. And its inversion of the hierarchy happens because Ram is playing a human role. When Ram plays this human role, at that time, his idea is that he will act as an ideal human being should. 
And this we see at various other places also. When the Ram also has a father. Now, it's interesting that what is Ram's father's name? Dashanana. And what is Ravan's other name? Dashanana. Dashanana or Dashak and Dashagriva. So, Ravan had ten heads but zero brains. <laughs> <laughs> he could understand that going against Ra would destroy him. Although so many people told him that, he never understood it. So, in this case, uh, Ra, uh, the, uh, the, Ra, as God, is the father of all living beings. He is the Mata, Dhata, Pitama, Idyam, Pavitra, Mongkar. He is the mother, father, Lord, grandfather of everyone. But when first time Vishwamitra comes to the palace of Dasharath, and normally the Vishwamitra is a very powerful sage, and the kings will go to his house for uh, to his place in the forest for taking darshan. Such a sage comes to your place. It's a special privilege, but it's also something very serious. So Dasharath rushes out to welcome the sage, and he brings him in. And then, he, he offers his respect, he washes his feet, does the arti, and then he asks, how can I serve you? And then Vishwamitra says that there are these demons in the forest and they are disrupting and desecrating my sacrifices. So, uh, Natashat hears with great concern. He had heard about the demons, but um, there had been a like a rough division of territory. And the, the southern part of the world was with the demons. And then there were the Vanaras who were living in Kishkinda. And then above was the Manavas who were living, the humans who were living. But sometimes the demons would overrun. So what happened was Wali and Ravan had an alliance. I will not attack you, you will not attack me. So when the Vanaras would come in his area, he would just let them pass by, they would not attack him. But uh, Dashat had heard that the Vanara, the Rakshasas are they are disrupting. But when he, he came to the thought that when he heard that Vishwamitra is saying that this is happening, he it must be very serious now. So he asked, Who are the who are the demons? And he said, oh, I will send my whole army right away. I'll myself come at the head of the army and will curb those demons. Please tell me who those demons are. And then Vishwamitra says, These demons are they are brazen, they are fearless. Because they are supported by Ravan. When Dashrath hears the name of Ravan, he becomes extremely grave. He almost becomes paralyzed. He says, with my whole army, with all my prowess, it will be difficult for me to curb Ravan. And then Vishwamitra says something, which is like a thunderbolt on the heart of Dashrath. He says, I don't want you or your army. I simply want Ravan. Ram. He says, he's just a boy right now. He's just a boy. He says, how can he fight? He won't be able to survive against those demons. He's not even learned the skills of archery well till now. So Dashrath is thinking about protecting his son. And Vishwamitra is infamous for something. What? Getting angry. Anger. <laughs> so he gets angry. And yes, sometimes some people, uh, by their face itself, they, are, they started glaring and their face starts becoming red. And some people, when they become angry, they start looking fierce. And they're looking very angry and they say, Don't make me angry! You mean you are not angry now? <laughs> <laughs> so, Vishwamitra doesn't have to speak anything. <coughs> Just by looking at his anger, it's, it's scary. Then why is it scary? Because sages are said to have great powers. They can curse. It's like, say, if we have a head of state, we had our friend in Korea was threatening to use nuclear weapons. <laughs> so, if a person is hot-headed, and then they have very powerful weapons, 
things just they might just be button crazy and they just drop press a button and big explosions can occur great devastation can happen so and somebody is very powerful and short tempered it's a deadly combination yeah, to be short tempered is bad to be powerful it can be bad if you abuse it but to come together it's extremely dangerous that's what is the concern now in america that some people have these assault vehicles assault weapons assault guns freely available so the people are worried about that so anyway everybody becomes very fearful what's happening and then dashrath receives the glare of vishwamitra and vishwamitra says that you promised to fulfill my desire that's why i came all the way to here and now you are rescinding on your promise will you disgrace your great dynasty which is always honored its promise and all the he doesn't threaten here to give a curse so immediately vashishta sees the vashishta and vishwamitra they go a long way back <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so then vashishta says calls the shatra side and he says that actually vishwamitra is powerful enough that he himself can destroy all the demons if he is asking your son to come with him do not worry he will cure ram the mantras the power by which he can destroy the demons and not only that ram is not the stone the child he is the supreme being have you forgotten the promise of sanak sanatan have you forgotten the prophets prophecies that happened when he was born but dashrath because of his affection had actually forgotten it so when he speaks this the shit is okay oh my son is god oh, okay then he lets him go but still his affection is so great that he feels worried so normally people pray to god for protection but dashrath prays for god's protection <laughs> <laughs> so when ram is going to the forest he's praying he's praying to his deities he's praying to the lord he's praying to vishnu please protect my son so this is also an inversion of hierarchy now ram doesn't always act as god as it if he is god then god can do anything that he wants at any time anywhere in any way and the whole the plot of the ramayana is there because ram usually acts within human limitations sometimes he transcends those human limitations but he acts so then at that time when he is in the forest he is all alone and sita has been taken away from him he is searching for sita you know in life all of us no matter how tough we may be you know, sometimes life will weigh us down and when life weighs us down we need someone to lean on we need someone to share our burden and the western culture is what you could say broadly it's ruggedly individualistic uh, there is a lone ranger is a uh, you go one person fights against the whole world so that is one ethos and sometimes people have to do that but in general we are social creatures and we need people support so when that is not there then life becomes unfair so although ram is omnipotent he does not act as if he is omnipotent he says oh i am alone what can i do i need some alliance and whose alliance does he seek sugriva sugriva is the head of who vanaras vanaras so the vanaras some of them are extraordinary beings who are like the who are descended from a higher level of reality but many of them are just monkeys so normally if we had some trouble would we go to a monkey for help <laughs> if something is normally something is lost Oh monkey, please help me to find it. Say, oh please monkey, help me to find it by staying away from here, <laughs> so that I can search. <laughs> so that I can search, isn't it? So monkeys are not particularly known for their intelligence or their diligence. Monkeys are known for restlessness. But Ram demonstrates the universality of 
his grace, of his friendship, of his love. That even a vanara, he, pref- and he doesn't just give shelter to, he befriends. Hmm? And then with all these vanaras, he goes to the forest. And when he goes to the forest, he, he, the, the vanara, first Hanuman goes and finds Sita, and he comes back. At that time, uh, then they set the whole army to go. And when the war begins, <coughs> Sugri, uh, Ravan and Ram, their contrast is very striking. I'll talk about that. I'll talk tomorrow more about Ram's selflessness. And how selflessness and sacrifice are characteristics demonstrated throughout the Ramayana. But today I'll focus on a different theme. So I'll be talking about what theme? Topsy turvy. So let's look at continue this thing. So finally, um, after a long, hard battle, Ram fells Ravan. And Samrut Dashanan Ravan Rama Samrut Dashanan Ravan Rama Samrut means he killed him. Uh, to take away his name. Completely took away Dashanan Ravan. The, the, the ten-headed Ravan he was killed. So then after that, as soon as this happens, the gods come in the sky. And the Devtas, they, they appear, in Krishna also we see the devotas are there and the action is going on, they are afraid, who is going to win, who is going to lose. But after the action gets over, they come and... In fact, in fact, when the action is going on, they are afraid, what if Krishna loses, and the demon will say, I was supporting them, I was supporting his opponent, he will come after me. So they, they stay hidden, they don't even show themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but after that they come straight so now in the case of in, uh, Indra and other devtas come and then they thank Ram this Ravan was a tyrant who terrorized the world you have freed the world from this great terror may you be blessed Ram and then very interestingly they ask Ram that when the devtas come, they give boons. Darshan of the devtas is not to go in vain. So please, O Ram, ask for some boons. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, if you see, Ram has given a boon to them by killing Ravan. Now, if you consider, there is a uh, there is a multi, the the Vedic universe or the Dharmic universe is multi-level. Mm-hmm. Prabhupada was asked, is there life on other planets? He said, obviously. Why would Krishna waste so much space? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, all that uh, honest scientists can say is that life as we know it does not exist on the planets that we know about. Because we can't just go over all the planets and look for life forms. What we look for is conditions suited for life. Is there oxygen? Is there water? Is the temperature suitable for living? But there can be other kinds of life forms. But anyway, the point I'm making is dharmic universe is multiple levels. So of course there are many levels. We'll focus on three broad categories among them. There is the earthly level, the terrestrial level. Then there is the heavenly level, which is the celestial level. And above that is the spiritual level or the transcendental level. So now Ram has come from the transcendental level to the terrestrial level. So Ram in his original position exists above the gods. But when he has come here, he has now come to the terrestrial level where he is below the gods. He is playing the role of a human being. And when he plays the role of a human being, what does he do? He acts like a human being. So the gods also know that he is, he is, see, there, there are gods with a small g and there is God with a capital G. So Indra, Chandra, they are all gods with a small g. And Ram is God with a capital G. So now when he comes from there to here, because he is acting like a Manava, as a human being, so therefore he accepts and he asks for it. But again, Ram, while playing the role of a human being, what boon does he ask for? 
Sorry? Yeah? Bring all the monkeys back to life. Yes. What he says is, all the monkeys, you know, there's a wounded, those who died, bring them back to life. And wherever the monkeys may live, let them have abundant provisions. Just, these monkeys have fought tirelessly, heroically for me. And normally after a victory, the king is meant to give rewards to the soldiers who fight for him. But he says, I'm in exile. Right now I have nothing to give. You, please bless them. Now, Ram could have said, I'm in the forest, I'm in exile, I have nothing. You give me things. But Ram doesn't ask anything for himself. He asks for the wanderers. So Ram is so conscious of his responsibility as a ruler. Most people want the, the privilege of being on the top of the hierarchy, but they don't want the responsibility of being at the top of the hierarchy. <laughs> Whenever like some, some kings are there, they said about politicians, before the election they shake your hands. After the election they shake your feet. <laughs> 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 so, they want something from us, but they don't want to give anything back to us. But Ram, he had nothing for himself, but still, he is giving. He is giving to the Vanaras, to the Vanaras through Devutas also. So this is also, although Ram is the god of the gods, Deva Deva. But he's taking benedictions, not for his sake, but for the sake of this devotees. For those who have assisted him. So in this way, there is an inversion of hierarchy. Now of course, the most enduring inversion of hierarchy is between God and devotee himself. We have uh, <coughs> Ram and Hanuman. If you can see. Where Hanuman jumps across the ocean to go to Lanka. But when Ram has to go, how does he go? He has to build a bridge and go through it. And then, when the bridge is being built, at that time, the Vanaras, they put, they put the name of Ram on the stone, and they put it in the stone floats. And Ram himself is amazed. He says, how are the stones floating? So, he comes privately at night to check, what is this magic? <laughs> and he picks up a stone, and he drops it. And it sinks. <laughs> and oh, he becomes embarrassed. And he looks around. See, sometimes if you are trying to do something and not able to do it, then suppose somebody doesn't know how to play kartal. And then they want to practice, but they don't really want to notice. They play and make a complete mess. They didn't even notice. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, Ram looks around. Did not even notice? And there's one person who is noticing very carefully. Who is that? Anubar. So, Ram becomes embarrassed. And Hanuman smiles, Hanuman comes up to Ram and says, My dear Lord, this is no mystery. He says, actually, if we take shelter of your name, even stones can float. In whatever, when stones can float, take shelter of your name. But, my dear Lord, you are teaching us. Anyone whom you let go of, they will sing. <laughs> so, Will anyone whom you let go, they will sink. So, so actually, here, the action seems to say that the Vanara is able to do something which Ram is not able to do. But the Vanara never think like that. Hanuman doesn't think, I am greater than Ram. So it is by your grace, O Lord, that the stones are floating. So, Ram has to build a bridge and Ram walks across the bridge. Hanuman does something extraordinary. Just not only go leaps across the ocean once, but actually does it multiple times. He again has to go to get the uh, herbs. And not, it's not just across the ocean, he goes all the way across the country to the Himalayas. He's able to do extraordinary things. And this is how the Lord enables the devotee to do more than what the devotee, what the Lord himself does. And the Lord delights in glorifying his devotees. The Lord delights in glorifying those who are serving him. And this 
is the opportunity that is there for every one of us, even now. At that time, the Lord had a mission to build a bridge. Now, also, the Lord has a mission to build a bridge. And bridges from the material world to the spiritual world. We are all like Sita. We are trapped in this world. Uh, and we are caught in illusion. And just in between the material world and spirit, between Tanka and uh, Lord Ram, there is a big ocean. So similarly, between the material world and the spiritual world is a big Vaitarani river. It is like an ocean. And uh, uh, we need a bridge to take people for, to ourselves go and take others across the bridge. And that is the mission of the Lord. And that is his enduring mission. To raise people's consciousness from the material level to the spiritual level. And for that purpose, what does he do? He engages everyone. Shri Prabhupada was such a person who took up the mantle, the responsibility of serving the Lord. And then, because Prabhupada had such a strong desire, that desire was transferred to devotees. And even devotees who did not know much philosophy, they would, they would share Krishna Bhakti and people would get inspired. And there's a scholar who came to see this Hare Krishna phenomenon, he called it. So many people are becoming Hare Krishna. What is happening? And then when he started asking, like probing philosophical questions, the devotees were not able to answer the questions. He said, I couldn't understand, I couldn't reconcile their confusion about the philosophy with their commitment to the practice. Mm. They had given up so practically everything just for becoming Krishna devotees. So I couldn't reconcile this till I met Shri Prabhupada. Mm. So here I saw a great saint who was fully devoted and he had answers to all questions. But it was not this philosophical uh, clarity that attracted him. It is a spiritual purity. This is compassion. So once Shri Prabhupada disciple, I just met him in Australia. And during that time, in the 1970s, 1980s, Australia was booming. Thousands and thousands of devotees were there. So this devotee was telling me his realization. He said that actually Prabhupada wanted to glorify Krishna. And Krishna wanted to glorify Prabhupada. And we became incidental beneficiaries in this mutual glorification. <laughs> <laughs> so, we had no qualification to actually speak about Krishna and attract others. But because Krishna wanted Prabhupada to be glorified. So, Krishna wanted Prabhupada's desire to be fulfilled. What is Prabhupada's desire? That Krishna be glorified. That many, many people come to Krishna and become his devotees. So, this reciprocation was going on between all of them and we just happened to be in between. So we got Prabhupada's mercy, we got Krishna's mercy. <laughs> and that's how we were able to do things, extraordinary things that we would ourselves have never been able to do otherwise. And that opportunity is there for all of us even now. The Lord's mission is that He is always there with us. His mission is always there and He is always with us in our hearts. And the inversion of the hierarchy is that the Lord often empowers His devotees to do more than what He has done. Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita and yes, the Bhagavad Gita was known across Bharat Varsha for thousands of years. And then some, trans, some, some people in the West heard about the Bhagavad Gita, they translated it, they appreciated it. But nobody committed themselves to the Gita. It was Prabhupada who presented Krishna's message. And he presented it such devotional depth and clarity that thousands and millions of people were attracted. So the glory of the Gita was spread far and wide. More than by Krishna, by Srila Prabhupada. So Prabhupada says that the devotee becomes greater than God by the grace of God. The devotee doesn't want to become greater than God. The devotee wants to always be servant of God. But by the grace of God, the devotee becomes greater than God. And that is the call for adventure. That bhakti presence for all of us. We all have our challenges, our problems, 
our issues to deal with. But in general, our problems are as big as much we think about them. There are problems that they need to be dealt with. But the more we keep thinking about a problem, the bigger and bigger and bigger it becomes. Initially, we do need to think about a problem so that we get some understanding about how to solve it. But after some time, we'll find that even if I think about the problem, it doesn't lead me anywhere. It just, uh, uh, I have a whole seminar on this, how to avoid overthinking. So, but one principle with which I'll conclude this talk, that if we consider a graph of time versus problem solving capacity. When we have a problem, we think about the problem, clarity comes up. Okay. Because I can do this, I can't do this, maybe I should do this, maybe I should consult here, some clarity comes. But after some time, it reaches a plateau. We think more and more, but no clarity comes. And if we can still keep thinking, then whatever clarity that also goes away. By <laughs> <laughs> overthinking, we start second guessing. Maybe if I do this, 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 this. Whatever little clarity there, it goes away. Some people get completely confused. Just by thinking and thinking and thinking. There's a old European proverb. It said that there's a donkey who was hungry. And there are two piles of hay. Equal piles at equal distance. And this donkey started thinking. Which pile? This or this? This or this? And he kept thinking and thinking, he just couldn't decide. <laughs> and finally, he died of starvation. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, say, this is stupid. But really, sometimes if you look at our own situation in life and we have problems, just keep thinking, keep thinking. You will not physically die, but actually, just by thinking about the problems, our energy dies. Our enthusiasm dies, our clarity dies, and we just feel miserable. So what we need to do is, yes, I have problems, I have to deal with them, I deal with them as much as I can. But I won't keep thinking about the problems. Let me think about the Lord. Let me think about how I can serve the Lord. Let me think about whatever abilities I have, whatever resources I have. Let me see how I can use them in His service. When we do that, when we take up that responsibility to serve the Lord, that responsibility raises our consciousness and makes us an instrument for raising others' consciousness. And by that, we find that gradually we learn, we outgrow the problems. Sometimes the problems get solved on their own in due course. Sometimes we, we learn to live with the problem and understand it is not as bad as I thought it was. Many problems are like uh, eating karela. <laughs> yes, eating bitter gourd is, is painful. But actually the pain is in thinking I have to eat it. <laughs> Once you eat it, okay, you eat it, it's not bad, it's over now. No, I won't eat it, I won't eat it, I won't eat it. It is so bitter, I don't want to eat it. <laughs> bitter gourd. It's a... Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> the idea is that just... If we don't overthink the problem, we focus on, yes, I do what I require, require to deal with my problem, but focus on serving the Lord. And if we focus on serving the Lord, take up that responsibility, Krishna will amaze us. The Lord will, Ram will amaze us in what all we will be able to do. Now, we will be able to discover abilities that we didn't have, that we didn't know we had. Some people say, I have so many hidden talents. <laughs> the only problem is they are hidden from me also. <laughs> but when we start serving the Lord, we'll find out that we had ability, the ability that we didn't even know about. And then as we take up that responsibility for serving the Lord, our problems will start diminishing. The world can hurt us in many ways. But greater than the world's power to hurt is Krishna's power to heal. The law, greater than the world's power to hurt is God's power to heal. So instead of focusing on the world and this problem, this problem, this problem, 
we turn towards the Lord. And not just, oh Lord, when are you going to help me? No. We turn to the Lord in the mood of service. What can I do for you, Lord? How can I serve you in this situation? We have a problem, we have to deal with it, but we don't become problem conscious. When we, when we devote ourselves to the Lord, the inversion that will happen is, right now the problem appears very big and we appear very small. So when the Lord's grace, right, the problem will become small. And when we are boosted by Him, we will become bigger than our problems. And thus, as the Lord assures in the Bhagavad Gita, Mat Sarva Durgani Mat Prasada Tarishasi If you become conscious of me, you will pass over all obstacles by my grace. That is the promise of the Lord and that is the promise we can experience ourselves. It is not doesn't say that the problems will go away. But you will cross over the problems. And we can all experience this. If instead of worrying, simply worrying about our problems, we focus on serving the Lord. Taking up service, taking up responsibility in service and absorbing ourselves according to our capacity in that. And then we'll experience this inversion of the hierarchy. We thought we were small and insignificant. And yes, we won't, not that we become proud and think I am great, but we'll find that even though we are small and insignificant, even through small and insignificant souls like us, the Lord can do significant things. And thus, our life will become fulfilling and supremely meaningful. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on the topic of the topsy-turvy world of bhakti. <laughs> and so I talked about hierarchies are important in life because hierarchies give a direction for excellence. So those who are at the top of the sports, the sports star is is has the most fans, not because of some unfair manipulation, but because they have the talent, the expertise. So sometimes hierarchies can become unfair when some people without competence grab position. But in general, hierarchies give a they give a direction for our quest for excellence and they also help us to appreciate those who manifest that excellence so in bhakti the fundamental hierarchy that we accept is that god is supreme and we are his servants so in that sense there is a establishment of somebody say why should i accept this why should why can i not be my, my own master why should god be the master but serving god is not like uh, becoming a um, becoming a slave. It is when we bow before God, He raises us up. Higher than what we could have risen on our own. And we discuss this inversion of hierarchy throughout the Ramayana. I talk primarily about Ram's going to the forest and at that time, Sutikshna, he had a darshan of Ram and he took Sutikshna to Agastya. And the inverted hierarchy here is that normally, the Guru takes the disciple to God. But here what happened? The disciple is taking God to God. Yeah, the disciple takes God to the Guru. And we talk about this inversion of hierarchy. Repeatedly it occurs. We talk also about Dashrath. Now, God is the father and protector of everyone. But Dashrath takes the role of a father and Dashrath acts as the protector. And he worries when Vishwamitra wants to take around to the forest. And that also adds the sweetness of Ram's activities. Then I talked about, third explanation example was, Ram taking help. He's God, and God, we are, we all need God's help. God doesn't need anyone's help. He's supremely independent. But the inversion of hierarchy is God says, I need help. And generally, if some very big person wants help, you think that person, that will go to another big person. But he, God is a supreme being, but he doesn't go to a big person. He comes to wanderers, monkeys. And thus he shows that his circle of grace encompasses everyone. No one is left out. And then we also discussed one more inversion of hierarchy was gods and God. So although Ram has blessed the devatas by, by <coughs> killing Ravan, who was terrorizing them, but at the end of it, the devatas see that Ram, he is from the transcendental realm, but he has come below the celestial to the terrestrial level. And thus, <coughs> and they ask for a man, they ask him, ask a boon. And Ram says, please bless my assistance. 
revive them, rejuvenate them, replenish their supplies, let them never have any shortage. So the conscientious ruler, he knows that I have taken service for them, I have nothing to give rewards, so he gives rewards. He asks the gods to give rewards. And the most defining inversion of hierarchy is between the devotee and the Lord. The law, the devotee worships the Lord, but the Lord empowers the devotee to do extraordinary things, even things which the devotee may not be able to do on their own. So the Ram's stones did not float, but the Mandara's stones floated. Ram walked across the ocean, Hanuman flew, leapt across the ocean. And that same principle applies even now. We are all souls caught in the Lanka of the material world and a bridge is to be formed to take us to the spiritual world, to our Lord. <coughs> and that bridge is what the Lord provides dharma to others. It's provided generation after generation by great devotees. So Srila Prabhupada has built the Krishna consciousness movement. This is also like a bridge for taking us all back. And in this... You see that Prabhupada had a desire to glorify Krishna and Krishna had a desire to glorify Prabhupada. And as people who didn't even know much philosophy, they were attracted, they were not they got attracted, but they attracted hundreds and thousands of people. So they were incidental beneficiaries in the reciprocation of love between Krishna and Prabhupada. And similarly for all of us also, if we try to serve the Lord, take up responsibility. To raise our consciousness and help others raise their consciousness. Then we will we will discover abilities, strengths that we did not know we had. We feel, I have so many problems, how can I do anything, anything more? Yes, we all have problems. But often, overthinking about our problems makes them bigger than what they need to be. So we do what is required to deal with the problem. But instead of stewing and obsessing over it, we turn our thoughts towards the Lord. Towards remembering him, towards serving him, towards trying to connect ourselves with him and connect others with him. And when we do that, then he will give us extraordinary power. And initially we may feel I am small, this problem is very big. But when backed by the Lord, it's in the problem becoming smaller and we becoming bigger. The world may have much power to hurt us, but greater than the world's power to hurt is God's power to heal. Thank you very much. Shri Ramachandra Bhagavan Ki Jai! Are there any questions or comments? Yes, So what should our mood while we are praying to Lord Ram? Like in what mood we should pray and what boon should be So Lord Ram comes in the mood of Mariyada Purushottam. So in what mood can we pray to him? Yes, he is, he comes as a human being, he comes in the role of a human being, but still he remains God. And generally, while the Lord is over there, people may not treat him as God always. But he is God, and especially after he departs, he is respected and venerated as God. The same applies to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not, uh, during his times, did not approve of people calling him God. But after him, God Yavishnu was a worshipper. So now, there is a universal aspect to prayer and there is a personal aspect to prayer. A universal aspect is that we look at the prayers that the great saints have offered and we repeat those prayers. And those prayers have special potency, like when you just Dakshinu Lakshmana Yasya. That's a prayer. There are many prayers like that. Tomorrow I'll talk about a few more prayers to Ram. But along with that, <clears throat> there are also personal prayers. So, generally, if some prayer comes from deep within our heart, 
then there will be more emotion in this day. So sometimes as devotees, we may artificially separate our life into material and spiritual. Mm. Oh, this is a material thing, I shouldn't pay to the Lord for that. Mm. So thinking like that, thinking of it like that, we see ultimately everything we are doing is for serving the Lord. So even if some material issue is there in our life, okay, pray, my dear Lord, please help me deal with it, resolve it in a way that is spiritually conducive for me. Mm. This is obstructing me. So please help me. So broadly speaking, what Ram demonstrates is, is you could say dutifulness amidst duress. Duress is distress, is great tension, great stress, and dutifulness. So we all have our duties, we have material duties, spiritual duties, and there is a lot of distress that comes in our life. So how can we not crumble? under the weight of the problem that we are facing. How can we not become resentful? How can we not become cynical? Mm -hmm. So it's easy in this world to become resentful and cynical. Resentful, you know, bad things happen to me. Everybody is so unfair. Cynical means the whole world is, is a terrible place, is a rotten place. We don't want to become, no, no. Yes, there is distress in the world, but there is also God in the world. And his redeeming grace is far greater than whatever the distress in the world. So, Prabhupada himself, he, was, he faced a lot of duress and distress. So many of his attempts to share Krishna Bhakti were thwarted. And even before that, in his, his Grahastha life also so much distress he went through. But Prabhupada stuck to his duty. He said, Ram did that. Even when he had to suddenly go to the forest, still he remained dutiful. So, we can pray to the Lord for dutifulness amidst distress. Dutifulness amidst duress. Dear Lord, let me not flinch in my duty. I have so many problems. What is the use of the chanting Hare Krishna? No. This is my duty. I will do it. No matter how many problems are there. Apadaram hartaram. The Lord is the, Lord is the stealer of distresses. If we stay devoted to Him, He will help us deal with it. So, we can pray especially, especially with the character of Ram, to pray for Dutiful strength to be dutiful amidst distress. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I just had a comment, uh, So your class actually reminded me of uh, one of the inspiring quotes from your flashcards, uh, and which became very popular. I actually sent that to many of my friends, and everyone liked it so much. Uh, don't tell God how big are your problems. <laughs> Tell the problems, how big is your God? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Really amazing. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, please. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to understand the behavior of Rama when he kills Sugriva. Uh, as a God, as a human, he could have just faced him in the front. Okay. So, why did Ram kill Wali from the back? See, there is, in many ways, or in most ways, Ram's actions are exemplary. And there are some places where something which he does seems to be questionable, not just questionable, hugely questionable. So, people zero in on that. And let's look at it from... Uh, three perspectives broadly. First is um, that uh, what is Wali's reaction and what is Ram's reasoning and then what is our overall understanding. Mm -hmm. So Wali initially rants. You know? He is so angry and he says, how dare you attack me like that? I thought you were virtuous but you have become vicious. He thinks, I, th I think it is because of associating with that vicious Sugriva, that you also become spoiled. And you have spoiled the name of the Raghu uh, dynasty. You will suffer permanent infamy. But then Ram gives his reasoning and then Wali completely comes. And then Ram at the end of his reasoning says, Oh Wali, if you still feel what I have done is wrong, then I will take out this bow and restore your life to you. And then Wali, what does he say? My dear Lord, Lives many we get, but a death like this in your presence is very rare. I choose this death. I choose this death. So 
if somebody who is supposed to be the victim of the injustice is satisfied it's like you know sometimes, sometimes there's a sometimes there's, there's a quarrel between the husband and the wife and sometimes the wife is upset and they complain to someone and then the husband and the wife patch up but then some other person they say oh, why did you patch up <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes outside influences make the problem bigger than what it is <laughs> So, if they have bachelor, what do you have? What problem do you have? <laughs> so, like that, Wali and Sugri had them. Wali and Ram have patched up so much so that Wali actually asks Angad to stay. Angad and Tara to stay under the care of Sugri. So he he, he has no suspicion about Sugri or Ram, and he also says Angad, Sir Ram, did Sugri. So that's the, that's the first perspective. The second is that. What does Ram say? Multiple things. First, Ram says us that uh, heroes should be fought on a war field, but you are not a hero. You are an aggressor. You are a thief. Since you stole away Sugriva's kingdom, you stole away Sugriva's wife, and because you are the older brother, for you to cohabit with his wife is like is incest. The, the older brother is like father. So he says, "You did all this, and what virtue can you claim now?" So, uh, Atatai, an aggressor like you, can be killed by enemies, and therefore you have received the just results of your own misdeeds. And then further, he says that if you claim, he says, uh, so Bali uses different arguments. He says that you know, I'm just a simple monkey living in the forest. So, what harm did I ever do to you? And humans are not even meant to eat monkey flesh. Monkey skin is also not useful. So, why did you kill me? So, Ram said, if you if you think that you are just an ordinary monkey, then kings have a right to hunt. And you are not just an ordinary monkey. You are a dangerous monkey. And you are you you caused harm, and you are causing harm. So, therefore, as a hunter <coughs> kills an animal. I have killed you. Now a hunter doesn't have to necessarily go in front of a tiger and shoot a tiger. <laughs> the hunter can shoot a tiger from wherever. So that that's another reason that he uses. <clears throat> and then finally he says that, as I said earlier, that you, if you feel that I have wronged you, then I will give you back his life. So that's Ram's own reasoning. That you were a you were a grievous wrongdoer. And you are you are an animal, so I kill you this way. Now beyond that, there is see, the Ramayana, Valmiki Ramayana is there, and beyond that, there are many later retellings of the Ramayana, and some of them have their validity. Some of them we have to see how valid it is. But in the later retellings of the Ramayana, it is said that actually Val, who Vali and Sugriv, they were expansions of the gods. So Vali was an expansion of Indra, and Sugri was an expansion of Surya. So Vali had got a benediction that you now whoever he would fight against, or whoever would come to fight against him, half of that person's power will come to him. And that's how now nobody could fight against him because Vali himself was very powerful, and the other person, whatever that power is, half of that power comes to him. So what happens is their power becomes half, and his power becomes their half plus his own power. That's how he had actually overpowered Ravan also. So he had overpowered Ravan also that way. So therefore, he he was he had the benediction. Now now the law Ram doesn't have to necessarily honor the benediction because he's a supreme being. But in general, if the devatas have given some benediction. The Lord honors it, so that's why when Hiranyakashipu had to be killed, the Lord could have come in any form and killed him, but he fulfilled all the conditions within the promise that Brahma Ji had given. So within the conditions of the promise which Vali had, well, the benediction Vali had, the only way he could have been killed was from behind. Because anybody comes in front of him to fight with him, half of that power will go to him, and then that person would that that person would get defeated. That's why Ram attacked him from behind. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Yes. Uh, can you please also talk about uh, 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 Trisita Vangaman in, in this light? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I can talk about it now, but uh, it'll require a whole class. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we could have the Sunday class on this topic, or you'll have a lot of non Indians at that time. No. We'll have repeat and. Okay. And Sunday I'll speak on this elaborately. Is that okay? But that's a very important topic. And I have a whole. In my book on the Ramayana, there's a whole essay on this, but it can be, and I can discuss it more elaborately also. Okay. So, so, any last questions? Yes. So, we uh, read about the Ram uh, in separation of Sita, like after Sita is kidnapped by Ram, and, uh, Ram is in total grief, Sri Ram and <coughs> Uh, talking with trees and mountains, you know, about uh, losing Sita. Uh, <clears throat> but after we read that, actually the original Sita was never kidnapped. She went into the fire and it was the, you know, uh, Veda. 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 Right. So then that mood of separation, how do we understand, is it, uh, because internally you already know original Sita is not gone. Okay. So then how is that, how to un understand that uh, mood, mood of separation? Okay. So, if the original Sita has not been not gone away, uh, from uh, not been abducted, then how do we understand Ram's intense agony in separation from Sita? Yes, <laughs> well, the original Sita may not have gone away to Ravan, but still she has gone away from Ram. <laughs> is it? <laughs> so, <coughs> she's not with him. <coughs> and that's why Ram is separated. And within his Leela, he doesn't know about this. Just know that Sita has been taken away. So, now you could say God is omnipotent, He knows everything. But then, if He starts exhibiting omnipotence within His pastime or omniscience, then why does He have to, why does he have to send Hanuman to search for Sita? And then send army in all four directions. So at that time, He doesn't know about this. And so because, so for Him, it is separation. And as far as, uh, He's concerned that some demon was taken, taken her away. And that's why he's in great anxiety and agony. And another point is that the whole concept of Maya Sita is not directly mentioned in the Valmiki Ramayana. It comes in the Puranas. And now I'm not saying that that is not true. But there are different perspectives. The same incident can be understood from different frames of reference where a particular point is being stressed. Say for example, you know, you go for a meeting. You, you have a meeting with someone and you go at that particular point and the other person doesn't come out. Now, you could put this in one frame of reference and this person is so irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Another frame of reference you could put it in this, you know, that nobody takes this service seriously. Another frame of reference, nobody takes me seriously. <laughs> Is it is a three different frames of reference. One is that person centered, the other is service centered, the other is me centered. Or you could make a bigger frame of reference, you know. The world is filled with untrustworthy. <laughs> <laughs> so you can take different frames of reference. Now it's not that one frame of reference is right or wrong. We have to see which is the most constructive. It could be that people are taking not taking me seriously. It could be that this person is responsible. It could be something else, the person is caught in traffic or whatever. We have, to, we have to place things in the most constructive frame of reference to move forward. So the Valmiki Ramayana's frame of reference primarily is that how Ram is diligently dutiful amidst all kinds of difficulties, which he did nothing to deserve. He is God, he is all pure, he has no bad karma. For no fault of his, he is going through so many difficulties and how he remains... So he remains diligently dutiful. And it is not that Ram doesn't feel distress. He feels distress, but he doesn't let distress deviate him from duty. Hmm? It's not that he, he is God, so I don't feel any distress. No, he does feel distress. Hmm. So, so the Valmiki Ramayana's perspective is primarily how Ram is an ideal human being. Ideal human being doesn't just mean 
you know, a person who achieves phenomenal things and say climbs Mount Everest and puts a victory flag over there. That is one way you will say ideal human being. But to make life yes to say yes to us, that is one characteristic of a great person. But another equally important characteristic of a great person is to accept when life says no and still move on. Not, not become resentful, not become hopeless, but still move on. So Ram demonstrates both. He, he, he wins in Swayamvar, the greatest prince at that time, Sita's hand. He kills the greatest demon. So he has great power. He does make life say yes to him also. But when life does say no to him, he accepts that also gracefully. So Valmiki Ramayana's perspective is that Ram is in agony in separation from Sita. And it's a great distress for him. But still he remains dutiful. Now the other Purana's perspective is different. Uh, that how can the goddess of fortune be touched by a demon? How can the one who is all pure become sullied even by the touch of a impure demon like Ravan? So then, to explain that perspective, yes, she cannot be condemned. The other Purana's focus on this point that actually it was not the real Sita, it was Maya Sita who was taken. So there are different frames of reference. And that's why there are different points which are highlighted in different Puranas. And uh, accordingly, we understand those details. But our primary narrative has to come from the Valmiki Ramayana. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Prabhu, can I have this one comment? Yeah, please. Uh, regarding the question that were asked, like how Mother Sita was sent to exile and how, you know, so the Bali was killed, you know, behind by the Ram. So I'll just add on that uh, your book, that is Wisdom from Ramayana, is such a wonderful book. And you have, how wonderfully you have touched upon all these sensitive matters, you know, which we see in Ramayana. So, you know, I highly recommend everybody, <laughs> that everybody should have that book. If you really want to deal upon all those sensitive matters that we come across in Ramayana. So, thank you. Brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll stop here. We can talk personally if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Shri Ramachandra Bhagavan Ki Jai. Shri Ram Nami Mahamahotsav Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupad Ki Jai. Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai. Gaur Premanu. Hari 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 Ho. Hare Krishna.